Hello, everybody. Welcome to the latest installment of Readings from Milwaukee, a joint virtual event series with Books and Company of Oconomowoc and Boswell of Milwaukee. I'm Daniel from Boswell. It is day 5006 of us being in business. We are allowing this to be a spoiler event. The book's been out in hardcover and in paperback for several months. So um, if you don't, if you're one of those people who hate spoilers, then um, listen to it later because the event's being recorded and we'll have that on our websites and on YouTube page and that kind of thing. But if you, you know, the truth is, I don't believe, first of all, there may not be spoilers in this book. And secondly, um, I don't really believe spoilers affect your reading of the book. So um, there you go. And for more on that, I give you Lisa Bedoin from Books and Company. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Um, I'm really excited to be doing this today. So welcome, Sarah. This is Sarah Winman is the author of four novels, including Still Life, Tin Man, A Year of Marvelous Ways, and When God Was a Rabbit. She grew up in Essex and now lives in London. She attended the Weber Douglas Academy of Dramatic Art and went to act and went on to act in theater, film, television, including a few of your favorite shows um, called Midwife, Prime Suspect, and more. Um, I'm really glad that she has found time to do both act and write because her novels are fantastic. So welcome, Sarah. Um, you want to give us a little flavor of the book too and just get us started. Oh my goodness. Right now. Hello, Lisa. Yes. Hi, uh, <laughs> hi Daniel. How everybody is going? Are we going straight into a reading? Well, we could chat a little. To open no, it up chat with a little. A little. If you yeah, feel yeah, yeah. like you'd rather do it later. Yeah. Let's, yeah, let's, let's chat a little. So yeah, let's, let's do let's that. Let's chat a little. Um, so, of course, we're going to chat about the book because okay. we chatted about everything else before you went on. So what was the inspiration for the book? A classic question that yeah. doesn't even show that I even read the book. Yeah. But okay. I'm just going to say I read it and I still want to know. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, the flood was the inspiration. So when I found out about the flood, you know, it's, everybody says, when does a story come to you? So I was in Florence in 2015 because I'd just done a very basic Renaissance art course at the National Gallery. And then I had this little bit of time. And so I went in January to Florence, which is a very good time to go because it's empty. And um, I was sitting in a restaurant and I saw these paintings on the um, photographs on the wall of the city underwater. And, and I, I just couldn't quite get my head around it because in my lifetime, I didn't know this at all. And then I started to talk to the owner and he brought out some books, um, but the story didn't get to me then. So then I walked around the city and he told me about these markers that were there and it showed the height of the water. And I thought, wow, this is incredible. And you know, what actually happened to the city? But then the story still hadn't got to me. And then I started to hear about the young men and women predominantly who came from all over the world to help clean up. And then I started to get interested because what was clear was it was 1966 and these young people would have been the children of the war generation. And of course, what had happened during that time was there was this democratization of Europe. They were wanting people to travel. They were wanting it. They were wanting Europe to heal. They were encouraging young people to travel. And suddenly the gesture seemed so much more than it was. It was about healing on so many levels. And it was about love on so many levels. And that they would come and they would clean up these artworks. But it wasn't just that. People were focusing on the art. But it was also about them going and picking up medicines for the older people, giving them piggybacks through the streets. It was, it was such a generous act. And some of these people, some of these young people, they fell in love. They, you know, it's the 60s, you see photographs of them and they look covered in mud and their eyes are glazed and they're stand, you know, standing by braziers and, or drinking and eating at trestle tables. And you just go, oh yeah, I know this feeling. This is the feeling when a story comes to you. And so that was the central point. And then because I thought about that and knowing about this war generation, then I knew that the starting point would probably have been the war. Wow. 
Was it, you know, now we think when a disaster happens and we send in and people volunteer for the Red Cross and Doctors Without Borders and all kinds of things like that. But I guess a lot of that sort of happened after this, you know, the, the real mobilization for disasters. Um, I, yeah, I hadn't thought of that. I mean, maybe it did. Maybe the accessibility of being able to travel easier to yeah. get to places. The world of opening up of plane travel where an everyday person could say, exactly. I'm going to go there and help. Yeah, altruism, you know, being having the time and the space for some people to do that instead of locked into long careers, you know, that my parents or my grandparents certainly would have had, you know, it wouldn't have, wouldn't have crossed my grandparents' minds at all. You know, he was working class, he was in a factory. You yeah. know, that's what happened. So I'm sure you're absolutely right that there was something about the sixties that opened up that kind of generosity, that spirit of adventure um, and wanting and wanting to help and wanting to leave a mark. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot about, when I was thinking about that, I was thinking about Katrina, you know, uh, Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans in the United yeah. States and how many people went down there and wound up settling there. And I, I guess in some ways, New Orleans is like our Tuscany. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and that has a romanticness yeah. to it. There's yeah. poor people just like in this book yeah. um, and working class, but there is still this sort of romanticism of the culture. There is a romanticism. Um, and I think. I think what it also shows us is the ordinary man and woman who actually live there. And I and I and it made me ponder very much at, at when do let's call it the artisanal working class move out of a city? Because there's always a time when they're forced out. And it's very clear that the start of the artisanal working class moving from Florence was the flood. And of course it's it it's owned by a lot of central Florence is owned by American universities. So NYU has a campus north of the city. Syracuse has a campus north of the city. You come to April and spring break, it's, you know, it's Americans, students and their families are there. And so a lot of the property was brought up in those sort of subsequent years. And, and I think it's always very interesting is to see that kind of gentrification that happens in certain disasters, that, that sometimes things are promised, that people can come back to their homes and people can come back and stay, but they don't. Wow. I read that you were also, when you were thinking about this, it was right in the height of Brexit and how that the two really sort of what happened before and what was happening now kind of spurred on that feeling. You want to talk a little bit about that? Because I thought yeah. that was really interesting. Well, I think so. I mean, so we had Brexit. So I was working on something. So yeah, 2015, I kind of had the little, the story was there, but I had Tin Man to write. So I knew that was happening. And then in between, after Tin Man and I starting, Brexit had happened, which has, which was a, was a disaster for this country and has proven to be a disaster for this country and everything that has happened since. But let's put that aside what it did with the manipulation of the press, especially and this very right wing government that we had, um, one of the things that it was stoking was this divisiveness of society and fracturing and and really making it about, you know, the in and the out remaining and or leaving. And whilst everybody was really at loggerheads, they in that kind of distraction were doing whatever they needed to do in order to pass this. What that did to me was it was the start well, you know it wasn't the start they'd been doing this for a long time but you could see that heavy weight of manipulation and um an anti-european rhetoric an anti-other rhetoric because you can't just have anti one thing you know these isms are all connected so you know it it was there and they were enjoying themselves and uh, I, was, I just felt very bogged down by it, really. And I thought, well, what do I really want to do? I, I need something else. I certainly need to recharge because we've got these people in for a long time. And I'm going to burn out if I don't have some kind of other focus or other energy around me. And so I thought, well, I suppose the phrase I've used was, what about using joy as an act of resistance? Because the one thing about fracturing of society is not, is to make people as depressed and as defeated as possible so they don't take to the streets. So let's bring joy into it. 
And also I, by then I was thinking, you know, my politics are very clear. I am pro-European. I'm going to write a pro-European novel. And I'm going to have a scattering of, of characters in there who uh, start out anti, but then start to understand maybe how how they that kind of has been there but but they haven't seen the gr the bigger picture as to what togetherness a stronger europe it's always been about that we are stronger it doesn't i think you know people don't it doesn't mean that we all agree you know i think that's the whole point but we are much much stronger in our access to making sure we know what's coming yeah. you know so that's that was the start of it and and I had a great deal of fun writing this book and and that's really what it was about and it and it was you know joy isn't it isn't a state it, it it's a kind of an energy and I and it's a lovely energy to write with it doesn't mean that the fear and the doubt isn't there many hours of the day but when you can ride that joy it's a very beautiful thing creatively and it opens up many possibilities. Um, and I think sometimes when I talk that people think, well, if you're, if you're writing in joy, then you're only writing, you know, light things or joyous things. And it's not the case. You can, you know, some of the, the, the deepest or the most emotional work came through that kind of joy. So that's where it came from. I did, none of us at that point knew the pandemic was coming. And that's the, that's the beauty of books and timing and a bit of luck that people did um, hold on to this book and managed to, uh, it, it brought people um, some kind of sucker during that time and, you know, kind of feeling that they were more than their circumstance, which is one of the great things about books. Um, so, you know, it, it, it was remarkable because I do remember at one point, I was talking to my friend Stella in Florence in, in April 2020. So the final, final, final deadline I had was August 2020. So the only the last sort of three, four months were written in lockdown and I was well under the way. And I thought, because Italy had it so bad, I thought, I hope this book just encourages one person to go to Italy who maybe wouldn't have. That would be awesome. And um, since then I've had a lot of messages from people who have gone, I wouldn't have gone, had it, I hadn't read the book and it's been lovely and it's, you know, and I've, we've been here and we've been there. And, and that means a lot because as I said, uh, Italy suffered a huge amount. I just want to comment on that. Something you tossed aside saying a smattering of characters. <laughs> There's, I kind of, I would like to say that smattering means is not that many characters. <laughs> Yeah, there's quite you a few. Have a lot of characters, and yeah. and many of them go through that wonderful transformation you're talking about. Um, I I I've read that you purpose like this was this was sort of one of your goals is to have a a, a, a story sort of with a a, a dramatic persona of multitude. Yeah. yeah, if I sort of look at the books I've written, we get one which is more expensive, one which is more. Quiet, one is expansive, quiet. So this has come out of Tin Man, which is a very sort of quiet book, very contained book. Um, and I love writing that. I can write it, but this was me going, you know what? I just, I don't, I want, I wanted to write my version of Cloud Street, which has multiple characters. Um, I was obsessed with a musical called Girl from the North Country, which is um, music uh, by Bob Dylan, but lyrics um, and words by Connor McPherson. And I saw it about four times and it was set. The trope was it was set in a boarding house of Duluth. And um, I loved the way these characters came in and out. And I suppose um, maybe I just, maybe the muscle was there that I knew I could do it. You know, I knew these characters. I, I've, I kind of grew up with some of these characters in a way, although they're not anybody I know. Um, and I knew that I could play that musicality of those characters. And, and, you know, I don't, structure is never in my mind when I write a book. I've never studied writing. I don't have to have that weight. I'd sort of jump in. So I never thought that I had to, you know, this character has to have this chapter or this character. It was nothing like that. It was really about the musicality and how 
it sat with me and and who was going to lead these this book and of course it was Ulysses predominantly and then Evelyn who who are the central characters and then and then they're held by other people but I, I think it was just I was adding more characters because they're the people who inform each other you know are they you get to know the central characters by how they relate to other people. And that's what's really important. They can't, you'd never get to know a character really singularly. And so how, how, you know, what is that love? What is that tension? What is that opposition? And then you get to know it. So, you know, I, it was fun. I loved them all. Um, and I had a great, a great journey writing them. And they do have such, joy with each other um and i don't know it's just the care that they have for each other that develops and grows over time because you know there's a lot of time that's being covered so we don't get into all the details but yeah it's that that just comes through so strongly lisa yeah. and i read a lot of books that are um i just was going to say and i hope you talk about this um we read a lot of books that are found family stories and this yeah. is Definitely. seems to be very much in that vein. You might have even thought about that when you're writing it. I don't think about it. It's just a very natural, you know, I've never kind of wanted, you know, I'm, I'm a queer writer. I'm a gay woman. And I came out in the early 80s. So I came out while, you know, AIDS was rearing its head and, and all of that kind of fear and, and that narrative, that cruel, cruel narrative that was happening with the press the church with the governments you know towards yes predominantly gay men but but as I said before you know you can't separate that if that's your society if that's your community you don't separate yourself from that you know it's if you're coming out and you're wanting to find your way in the world and this rhetoric is going on it's very effective now I say I was lucky I I had a very supportive family but I had lots of friends who didn't and so you just you bonded. Your friends became your family. I mean, that's how it was. And it's, it, it's, it does, I don't have, even have to think about it. You know, my friends and my family. It's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, I'm lucky. I have lovely family members. But I don't have, I don't feel there's a seam between some of my oldest friends and what does one want to term, you know, who, who you grew up with. So, it's something that's really important. And I've written about that in all my books and I probably will because I also think it's, I think it's very necessary because so much in our society has been socially constructed, you know, and this has gone back centuries, you know, it's gone back through colonialism, it's gone back through the church, you know, and if you start to deconstruct that, none of it makes sense. So the whole idea of family and sexuality and motherhood, all of it, it's, it's been there because it actually, it serves certain people in society, but it doesn't serve everyone. And the more you look at that, the, the model of that um, needs to change. Will it change in my lifetime? Probably not, but one day it will. And that kind of freedom and that kind of blanket care, I hope will, will kind of, will come back. And I do see it now, but it's, you know, it's still being held. Those reins are still being held by, a lot of people in authority, but I think it. I think it won't remain because I think it is a really good place to be, and and we had a little glimpse of that during the pandemic, you know, um, of what that of what that kindness and looking out for one another can do. Now it sharply took a whiplash back <laughs> to to um, you know certain areas of cruelty, but for many people it remains. You know, you can't unknow your neighbours. You suddenly got to know them. They're there. So, you know, there is there there is good things that can happen from that. And that's and that's why I write within that position. Do you want me to go? Sure. <laughs> I was gonna say we were talking about Evelyn and Ulysses being like the main driving characters, but I think um Cress was the glue that just stuck everybody together. Yeah. You want to talk about Cress a little bit and his origin because it's so much of what you just said reminds me of him and yeah. his outlook on life and and going to those spaces that really are so shared amongst humans and yeah. instead of amongst you know roles 
Sure. So, um, although I don't write about it, a little bit of my history is I, I was lucky. I grew up with four grandparents and my grandfathers um, both left school at 13. So my, so this is a little bit more reflected in Tin Man. So my mum's dad, he had a greengrocer shop on Cowley Road. And my dad's dad, Tom, he worked in the car factory, but both left home, uh, left school at 13. My mum's dad, uh, he self-educated. Um, and he kept reading, he was a big reader and very quiet, very perceptive, very wise man, even though he probably didn't go far further than sort of four square miles from where he was born. Um, my grandfather, Tom, he didn't. Shortly before he died, we had conversations and he said, I have felt stupid a lot of my life, most of my life. And one of the things that was so important to him as far as education went, and this is very much with a lot of working class people of the period, when he went to war, he would never have traveled had he not gone to war. So on one side, you have the horror of what these, as I say again, predominantly young men were, had to confront and were forced to do. And on the other side, some of it was the best time of their lives as far as an experiential education. And between those two men is Crest. Um, added to that, what was very important as this book went along was, so I'm repositioning the gay narrative. So I'm saying this story is about joy. This is about how I think the world and society can be. And it's not something that is so far and, and so far away. It's very reachable. One of the things that I suppose we talk about within feminist politics, which it seems to be so much about women talking about what we need to do, what we need to do. One of the things we need is we need good men. Mm -hmm. That's what we need. We need good men who enter this sphere. And the sphere that they need to enter is the feminine space. And this is not engendered. This is an energy. And, and it's about listening and it's about creativity and it's about um, responding and nurturing and two things which are very important about that space is cherishing the earth and cherishing matter. And one could then take the word matter as meaning mother. And we could take that even further and say women, because how we treat the earth is how we treat women. And when one changes, it'll all change. And so what I wanted this book to be, I wanted it to be full of good men. And Cressy is, he is showing all the men in this book how you walk into this feminine space and how you live well in this feminine space. And so he is, he's understanding about conversing with nature. That's not magic realism. That's just an old man who really, really does believe that if he quietens down and he allows his feet to touch the earth, he knows the secrets of what it can be. And there again, you know, when he's so eager, so he's looking up, uh, 1968, the 24th of December, and he wants to see the Apollo rocket up there. And then while he's looking up, they're looking down. And of course, the first color photograph of the earth was taken, um, Earthrise. And I feel really moved about that, pain, uh, that photograph. And actually it was taken with a Hasselblad camera. So there William Anders is, and they've just basically they've turned a corner and they've seen the earth going up from the moon. And he's like, I don't have a camera. And he reaches for his camera and he really he doesn't got any film. And he's like chewing, getting his, loading this. And he takes this photograph. And it's iconic because it's in color and we see this incredible, beautiful home that we have. And so a man took that photograph and Cressy is just, he holds this as being the answer and it is the answer, the purity of this photograph, the beauty of our home is the answer. And of course it's, it's in direct opposition to what we know today. But until we have good men in these 
spaces of power, nothing is going to change. Nothing will change. And, and, and that's why I, and I think I will continue to write these stories about good men because I want these men to come on board and realize how incredible their life would be if they enter this space. Mm -hmm. They don't actually have to give up that much. And what they will be giving up is something that is actually quite damaging for them because there is this kind of space that will be really good. You know, I'm talking, you know, for, for everyone, not necessarily a gender thing. But so, so that's really Cressy, what, is, what Cressy is representing and actually who Cressy is as a man. And, you know, Cressy loved his mum. Cressy genuinely loved his mum and saw her struggle and, and wanted to do it differently. I was wondering, one of the other things that seems to draw, tie a lot of characters and help with their growth is uh, not necessarily visual arts, but the arts in general. It's like almost every character has some sort of way to express that artistic voice. Yeah. And um, you haven't talked a little about that, but I assume that's an important part of the equation as well for you. It is. It is because, you know, it's the arts have sort of been this, kind of arena for the middle classes which is just nonsense but because of money because of all of those kind of things but it's it's there for everyone and that's one of the things that that Evelyn is saying what privilege does she says you know one of the responsibilities of privilege is that you raise other people up that's what you have to do it's a responsibility I've said it before it's a responsibility of wealth you know wealth is often you know wasted on the wealthy because there is responsibility with all of those things. And, and, and what the arts can do, and I, recently we had something, there's going to be something like an arts bank or a theatre bank in this country. It's, I don't know the details of it, but somebody was saying, okay, we've now got, we've got food banks because people are starving. We have um, heat banks, warm banks, places that people can go because in this country um, people can't afford they're heating anymore you know that's what's happened so they need to go somewhere and somebody's coming up with actually we also need um places where art spaces where people can go who can't afford it because it's also part of nourishing it's mm -hmm. so important to nourish the soul and this conversation never comes in because usually it's like oh you know you think people should go to the theater or shouldn't they eat and you go these aren't in direct opposition you know, that's not what this is. That's not the question. People should have access. They need, they need this because it can, it can bring about, number one, it can bring about just an immense amount of joy, but it can also shine a light on other things in life. You know, it can make people feel less alone. It can show a response. It can move people. It can, you know, and I'm talking this about music and theatre and uh, paintings. It's, it's not about having to go into these spaces with great knowledge about a composer, an artist. It really is, as I write with, with um, Evelyn, it is about response. How do you move? How are you moved? And if you're not, that's okay too. But it's, it's part of access to beauty. It's part of access to us being human beings because that's what we've always done. We've always held something in our hands we've always crafted something mm -hmm. we've always offered up something to the next person and and it comes with great value and i think it's just that value is often diminished in times of such hardship because obviously people just need to get by but it needs the access to it needs to be there and one of the things that I feel very strongly about, certainly in state education, is how the access to the arts is now being hugely diminished. Some schools here, we don't have libraries. People, there's no arts curriculum at all happening. We had a recent um, education minister, Nikki Morgan, who said anyone who does, wants to go and study art or humanities will be held back in life. This is our recent government. You know, 
one day there's going to be many people who will live in a kind of a post work world because their jobs won't exist. I think it would be really nice if they feel that they're at places that they could do, go that would still give purpose, would still give them kind of a richness of life. As I said, you know, education, thinking that, you know, you are more than your circumstances, which for many people at the moment is dire, or just somewhere you could laugh, you know, some, something other than where you are now. And, and that's what I write about. And what I feel I want to, is, is the accessibility of that. You know, not the hierarchy of art. I think it should be for everybody. And, and that's what I write. You know, I take, I spend, I spend probably half the time when I've written the book, crafting a book so that it's readable, which in kind of big literature terms, you know, people don't like that word. I want everybody to be able to read it. And within that, maybe I'm offering something up that they hadn't thought about, but I want it to be readable and I want it to be beautiful. And I want things to be there that maybe some people hadn't thought about. And they might not think about it again. That's irrelevant. I'm not trying to change the world here. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's, I really don't like people being excluded from these spaces. And I've, I've been in two spaces. So I've been in literature and I've been in um, acting. And I live with a partner who's been in the visual arts. And I know how excluding these spaces can be. And there's no need for them to be like that. You know, they should be for everybody. I'm curious, Lisa, would you mind if I asked, just because <laughs> you've been talking a little about acting and theater, um, how, how do you feel like your life as an actor has affected your writing perhaps differently from other people who haven't gone through that? But I didn't say you could take my question. Oh, was that your question? No. Oh. My question <laughs> was, was how is inhabiting a story different as a writer versus an actor? So they're basically the same, but. There are how? two parts of it. It's a two part yeah. question now two from two questions. people. <laughs> um, um, well, okay. They're, yeah, great questions. I, I, I wasn't a terribly successful actor. People are very generous when they say, you know, that I might have been. Uh, my success as an actor was that I couldn't let go of it <laughs> and I kept doing it. <laughs> so, I, so, you know, um, and I believed in it. That's what I did. And so I didn't really do much acting actually towards the end. So when I think about my life writing, uh, there's, and, and the inhabiting of a story, there's no comparison. I didn't really inhabit much of a story when I was acting. In the early years, I did, when I was doing more theater. But I have, I have more control over a creative environment than I ever did as an actor. You know, as a writer, you're actor, you're the director, you're the producer, you, you do props. You know, you, you do the whole lot. <laughs> and as a, as a writer, you, as an actor, it's very, very small, you know. And you don't, sometimes if you're doing telly, you don't have time to um, rehearse with other actors. So you just go on, you do it, and that's it. That's your experience. And I live, I live with the theatre of a book for, for, what, two years, two and a half years. So it's, the, it, you know, that it's a very beautiful thing. Um, how is it ex the experience of being an actor? I suppose um, it, it character, I would say that would probably be a character and dialogue. I, I would imagine they're the most important things is understanding the rhythm, um, understanding how people talk. It's all about listening really. Um, and also, but I think it's cinema as well. You know, I love film. Probably film is my was my first love, um, even though I'm not particularly brilliantly educated around all, all the old films. It's it's what makes me incredibly excited. And so when I'm writing a book, I do write it with kind of film cuts or I might have an establishing shot and then I'll kind of weave a camera and think about a two shot or focusing on a glass being upended. And I like that kind of play. So 
I suppose I have that access, that other access of, of knowing that I can do that. Um, can't remember if I answered the question. Is there another part to the question? Well, and I, one of my booksellers says this, this book, it feels like a movie. The first part of the movie is in black and white and then they get to Italy and suddenly it's in color. And he said, I kept reading it as scenes. So he'll be thrilled to know that that's how you were envisioning it because he's yeah. really, and he's a huge movie watcher. So yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, I do like that. And, um, and I often think I say to people, you know, just if you're stuck with a book, just go and see a film less so television because it's a smaller screen and you, you know, it's distracted. You're at home, but go, go to the cinema mm -hmm. and, and see how a story is moved along and how little you need. Sometimes if it's already established, you can make a big jump, you know, the reader will go with you for sure. If you, if the first part is, you know, or, or, or you've established a kind of a robust character. Lisa, you get another question because I interrupted you. You didn't interrupt me. You know what? But I wanted to go back to the way you were talking about art because Daniel and I were talking a little bit about this. It was just exciting for me to have characters talk about art in such a pure joy, um, experiential way instead of such an academic way, but not separate the um, the validity of the of an academic approach with the pure, just responsive approach and yeah. the necessity of viewing art. And it was so refreshing to see that in a book and to see it coming from both a male and a female character, because yeah. we don't see that very often. And, and then the influence it had on Ulysses to grow into that space and create a life where it's about what we do every day, the way we present our meals, the way we present ourselves to friends, the way we care for each other, how that becomes an art in itself. It is, exactly. I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's great that you picked up on that. I mean, so much about this book is about opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, so was Tin Man. I, I like to write about opportunity and people having that and what you do with it. And so, you know, we have in the epigraph, the Baedeker, which is a slightly tongue in cheek, but so it says one of the primary objects of the enlightened traveler in Italy is usually to form some acquaintance with its treasures of art. Even those whose usual avocations are of the most prosaic nature unconsciously become admirers of poetry and art in Italy. And I took that as, can you be changed by going somewhere or being an environment of beauty? How will it change you? How will it change your outlook? Can it change your outlook? You know, um, there they was a period of time, sort of in late Victorian when they started to build kind of different kind of council housing or social housing here, that, that they were quite aspirational because they, even then they had this idea that if, if it was a beautiful home, people would react differently to their circumstance. And I think it is an interesting um, point of view that if you're surrounded by something and you see it every day and you see how the light falls on buildings, what does that do to the eye and the brain? You know, how it, how it is taken in. What does it do to your mood? Does it, does it? You know, it's a question mark. I, I would say my feeling, it changes, not for everybody. And, and I knew how I wanted to write about um, art and I've read some which has not been so good and I've read others that I as I said I felt was excluded or is excluding of people so I was very I knew where I wanted to place it and I knew what I knew but I didn't think that was enough because probably what I knew is what a lot of readers knew you know it's not my big subject I, I know what I respond to but it's not my great education so I needed somebody who was going to be it and um, and that was my chance meeting, because that's another question I'm often asked. Did you have a chance meeting? And I did have a chance meeting and it happened uh, at an acupuncture se um, session with somebody who I don't usually have acupuncture with, but she was Italian. And I often don't share during these moments, but she was sticking needles in and she goes, how are you doing with your book, Sarah? I went awful. And I, I don't. I say it's awful. I mean, who would write an art historian and know nothing about art? Um, and Florence, I said, I don't know what I'm doing. She goes, well, what, what if you could have anything? I went, oh, that's so easy. And she's sticking the needles in. I went, 
she would have been somebody who was art historian, went to Florence during the flood, um, stayed there, Anglo, uh, Anglo-American, so, you know, English speaker, um, who's still practicing. That, I, you know, that would be amazing for me. And she goes, hold on a minute. And she got her phone out and she's like sticking needles in it. And then you hear, bing! And she goes, oh, okay. And she needles in, and she goes, bing! And she goes, okay, Sarah, tonight you're going to have an email. I went, oh, okay, great. That night I went home and I had an email and somebody said, I found you somebody. She's in her seventies. She went to Florence during the flood. She's Anglo-American. She's still there and she's waiting to meet you. And I was flying to Florence the next day and uh, I phoned her and her name is Stella Rudolph. And she said, come and see me, come and see me. I said, all right, all right. And I really wanted her to like me. So I went to the, um, off license or the bottle shop and I got bubbles and red and white wine and then I later knew in our friendship that she liked something called rosato frizzante which is like fizzy rosé and I didn't get that but anyway <laughs> <laughs> Rudolph was one, of, was one of the great art historians she was married to a great one um, Gian Lorenzo Malini who she was married to who died I don't know 18 years before so I had my disposal of this incredible woman, this incredible brain. But she thought I was an art historian student and she kept sending me off to obscure places. And I'd like, I'm going, oh no. I, and she was at her subject, which she used to pronounce it like this, was Baroque. And I'd go, oh, it wasn't even my, the timing that I wanted. And she was fun. And I, I kept thinking, no, this... There's something there with her. There's something. I've just got to unlock it because she's she's so used to talking in this framework of academia. And I know there's something else there. So there was one afternoon, we just had lunch and she always used to hide her cigarettes, but she would be there like this. And I go, Stella, what did you think of Michelangelo? And she goes, oof. Like, what an awful question. What a basic question. And then she goes, Oh, he was an earthquake. And I thought, oh, I've got her now. This is the kind of language that I want, that nobody, only somebody who's got 40 years, 50 years would understand why you would say he was an earthquake, why he was a slap in the face to his peers, why he was this. And consequently, we started to talk in this way. And I would ask her questions based on that. So most of the um, you know, at least the accessibility of art that you're talking to came from her. You know, and one of the things, every time I, you know, reread things here, uh, it's all Stella. Stella died during the pandemic and it's all her. And there was one moment where I, she, we went for a walk and there was this beautiful yellow flower <clears throat> growing. And I wrote about it. And she said, look, 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 look. Look at this, look at this beauty, look at it. It was a weed actually. She's pushing itself up through these 15th century stones and all these tourists are just looking at the building. And look at this, just with all the effort pushing up to show us its beauty. And I said, so Stella, what is it? <laughs> art versus nature. Oh, well, with art, my mind is taxed always my brain is always thinking but with nature I just look down and it requires nothing more than to be appreciated and that was her and and she had this amazing way of of giving me what I wanted you know and and I could weave I mean I had to weave because she talked very quickly and half the notes I couldn't understand but but it, but it was this lovely mix of kind of academic but also very <laughs> excuse me accessible and so I was very lucky to to kind of have her really to guide me in that way I <laughs> I just want to say that I have to tell one of our the people in our book club who was who said almost exactly what you said about opportunity and taking opportunity and I, I'm perhaps it slaps us in the face with some of the wagers that happen in the book uh, successfully, but she 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 basically gave the speech. She's like, every character is given an opportunity, and and it's all about whether they take the opportunity or not. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and uh, definitely clearly in there. Um, I I wanted to tell you that I had uh, I'm interested in always interested in through lines, and I love that you're talking about the connections between uh, Tin Man and this book. Um, I sort of saw it in there's there's a sort of a triangle at the center of both of the stories, and one and I also love the way you're talking about art because one of the things a lot of artists say that writers don't always feel is that art is only complete when the viewer sees it, interprets, you know, it's it, art is a conversation between the, the creator and the viewer. And I feel like writing is like that too. Mm-hmm. And we had a conversation in our book club about who was Ulysses Love of his life? And was it, you know, he had several people that didn't quite work out, but who would, who was that? Lisa feels like she solved the problem. But I want to hear. Well, I don't you... because I also went home afterwards, and the way you looked at me, and I was like, I came home and I was like, oh yeah, that was really stupid. I should have known. No, 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 no. <laughs> oh yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> but I was just because I that's what I was talking about. It's just that he. Um, what did I say? I didn't record that. I don't remember because we were going back and forth. We were trying to decide if it was really if he was holding out for Darnley or if he just hadn't found the right person or if it was just him being the person that was taking everybody in, you know, or 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 I mean, and and there's okay. definitely an interpretation from readers that Peg is, yeah. you know, that it's just, the circumstances are never right, but that Peg was love and uh, was was his love. So we want to know, I think we know what the answer is uh, because of what you've said about the book before, but we'd love for you to talk about that and how you've dealt with people not always agreeing with you about what you no, were trying to say. I, but I think that's it. But you know, once a book goes out, it becomes, it becomes, a, it becomes the reader's book. So I, who is the love of his life? I don't always think that we have one love of our life. You know, I think that's the point. I think it's a very romantic notion. And I think people become the love of that part of their life or that is the love of our, what that part of our life. You know, some people have it and it runs all the way through. But for me, um, Darnley was um, a love of his life during wartime. He hadn't experienced that before. Uh, he hadn't experienced an attraction to, to, to men in a man in that way before, but I think it also comes back to, it came back to somebody who just loved him, a man who loved him and who educated him and took him on the most incredible journeys and and, and also what wartime does and did. I think there were a lot of men during, I mean, I can only talk about the second world war. I, because of my proximity with my grandparents, I think a lot of men fell in love with men during the Second World War. Well, and I you know, think that I was glad that you left it not vague, but somewhat vague because it opens up that space where female friendships are often like that. And we yeah. don't see male friendships often like that. And to see two men talk about art and to see him educate Ulysses on that, not educate him, but just open up the world in a way of seeing and his just love of it. And yeah. it not have to become this sexual relationship that was so obvious that it could just be that passing of a great joy of living to yeah, somebody exactly and whether it turns out whether if he lived it would turn into something more romantic whether it was romantic or not seemed to be not as consequential as the whole effect he had on changing the course of his life exactly that exactly had had he not had Darnley he may not have moved to Florence you right. know obviously it was Darnley and Evelyn but it was them together. It was what Darnley was saying and taking the opportunity that Darnley had laid down the beauty of that country. It says, you know, he tried to remain ambivalent, but it was useless. Darnley had seen to that, that basically Darnley had given him the love of Italy. And, and Darnley says, you know, you save my life every day. You save my life every day. And that's an act of love. Yeah. And and it is, and I think you know the the fact that that he does stay in Ulysses' side it doesn't stop Ulysses from you know having sexual relationships. But I don't think it's that important. We do, Ulysses is having sex. 
in this book. You make it clear. He just doesn't want to. He's got so many people around him. He doesn't feel that he's connected. He's connected and he's having sex with people. So that absolute desire to just have that one person isn't really there for him. You know, maybe that is opportunity, but I don't think it is. I think he's got a lot going on. He's also bringing up a kid, you know, and that's, and he wasn't expecting to do that, but he is. You know, there's many, many reasons that, that have allowed him to be fulfilled in a way that maybe society, uh, maybe Dean isn't successful. You know, it was one of the things that we talked about within the ending of the book. How do we do it? And I said, you know, because there was a talk that, but he doesn't have anyone. And I said, but it's okay. He has loads of people. He has everyone. everyone. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's it. So I do believe had Darnley lived, they would have had an opportunity of something together. You know, I do believe that he wouldn't have shied away from that. But it's very clear that he's not like that. When Massimo kind of comes out to him, it's like, I hope he's good to you. There's no, there's no edge to Ulysses around that. You know, I think he's very free and the way he, you know, kid Alice, you know, it's, it's nothing is a surprise for, for him. It's just, you just love. And, and I think that's true. If you've been in a kind of the arena of war, then it is about life and it's about living. It's about loving and everything else is pretty extraneous. We're never going to get through all my questions, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh crap. Um, go on longer. I, I want you to longer. know that you got me. I I I had read about sort of the little connections to Room with a View. So I actually read Room with a View after this. Right. I don't have that much, like I don't feel like it changed my dynamic of the book. And I was like, ah, yeah. I like still life better, which is a very <laughs> so odd I. thing to say. Um but um, I'm curious um, that you there 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 were, there were some there, it did you did use it a little as a I, I wouldn't say it's an homage or anything like that but you did use it a little as a jumping off point. Of course, of course. So I that? didn't I didn't you know I had no intention of writing a novel about Florence. I didn't want to write a, I didn't know Florence. I hadn't really been to Florence. I didn't you know what am I going to do? There's been so many books written about Florence, really good ones. Why am I doing this? What can I offer? What, what is going to interest me? You know, um, and part of all the research, one of the things, so if we go back into, I think it was 1984, the film A Room With A View, which is, I came to that before the book, just slightly about a year, maybe less. But my acting agent at the time had about three major stars in that film. So whenever I was with Julian, he, you know, he, would put music on, he'd put Puccini on and smoke a cigar and drink lots of Italian wine and weep, you know, because that was what was really important. So I knew this film very well. Now it's a very different beast to the book. You know, the book is about social commentary, about Englishness, about middle class. It's about disparagement of lower classes. It's about who has the right to comment on art. And I love that. And that's what I was kind of taking in to this to my book, um, whereas the film is very much about the romance of this and it, and it does it really well, but the darker aspects remain in the book. But I just, you know, the more I was reading about this book and then I realized that there was a pensione. So in the book it's Bertolini, but in real life it was pensione simi. And then I started to read um, Furbank, so his biography, but also volume one of his uh, letters he edited that Forster um, wrote back to people. And in the beginning of this, um, this volume one was all the letters he wrote, uh, or a lot of them, when he was on, so when he left Cambridge, so in 19, <clears throat> he went on a year long holiday with his mother. And so I love this idea that he ends up in this very, this, sort of middle-class English pensione run by a Cockney. And it was run by a Cockney. And so I've, I'm getting this, you know, the precedent. I can have my lot set up a boarding house because it's been done. And I've heard that it was done. The more I read, there were these like little pockets of, of houses. There's a lot of English people 
a lot of English in Tuscany um, over the centuries. And, um, and then it was like more what ifs. Well, what if Evelyn met him? What about a concept that, that Evelyn as a young woman is having the best sex of her life <clears throat> with a maid and Forster is closeted and wouldn't lose his virginity until he was 37 actually. And what if we reposition that narrative? And what if we just write it as a very, you know, sexually aware book in a way that Forster could never do? What if we do that? What if we just say, thanks, Morgan, I'm running with it in a way that you couldn't, um, as my freedom as a gay writer, which is what I can do. And, and then what if Evelyn says some of the lines that he takes and writes down in a room with a view? I mean, you'd really have to know room with a view to know that was going on. But again, I had fun with it. So that's really where that came about. So that's where the ghost <clears throat> hangs over this book. But then we look into Forster even more. Forster was all about interconnectedness. You know, the epigraph. Oh, how it's end. Thank you. Only <laughs> um, and this only connect business is, you know, so he was president of Cambridge Humanist Society up until his death in 1970. So he was a humanist. He was very interested in the connection within a wider sphere of society, but also in human beings, the light and the dark, what is in opposition, sacred and the profane, the educated versus the not, life of the spirit, life of the body. And these things do move around in his books. And and that's that's what I started to sort of bring in a little bit more and uh, and weave through it. Um, and so yes, that end bit was just a fun thing to write for myself, really. All right, I'm going to just go on. So I'm giving it to Lisa. Well, if you have one more. Well, I I I promised we would do something structural and or something to do with the end and so one of the things that my book club talked about Lisa and I talked about was your decision about ending the book with Evelyn and Evelyn Evelyn um uh, color has, anytime I say color it has a U in it today I just want you to know and um I'm just, just I'm curious as to why you made the decision to put Evelyn Evelyn's story at the end I can't do it um, put at the end instead of somewhere closer, you know, intersp interspersed through the story? Um, yeah, um, people did ask me that. So we, it, during the editing, we talked about it. For me, well, what we have is we have Evelyn to start with as an older woman. And then she's a young woman at the end, because I think with women, especially when you see them old, we don't ever see them young. With men, it's different, but I think predominantly with women. And I wanted, I wanted people to see her young. I wanted people to see her sexual. I wanted people to understand what her journey was in the way that she's educating people. She was educated by this poet. Um, and then I did. I, I, I talked about this, uh, whether we should bring it forward. And this is where I learned a huge amount about editing. And, and when something maybe doesn't sit right. So I did, I did move it. I moved it myself and it didn't work because there is a paragraph about beauty and life and it's still life in all its beauty and complexity. It's that one, Sunday is a mere loneliness. And, it's, and it hooks onto the end of that scene. And that to me is an end. I couldn't mm -hmm. separate those things. So... When I was first working on it, and and people and a couple of people going, look, I'm not sure because you've just we're coming to the end, and then you're asking the reader for another, you know, ninety pages, and I'm going, well, I would do it. I don't ask the reader to do anything I wouldn't do, so I'm never going to worry about that. But what I realised is that it might not be that that is wrong. It might be the lead up to that, which is wrong. And it was wrong because what I'd done, the lead up to that, so we had this birthday, the lead up to that 
was already dipping down to the end of the book. And then of course you're asking your reader to read and I, it didn't work. So it wasn't that it was in the wrong place. It was the, 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 the run up to it was wrong and it had to be joyous. So it wasn't dipping down, it needed to go up. Yeah. And that's what it is. And I've learned so much in that sort of editing process that some things were not sitting right. And it's very easy to say that's not right, but you know in your heart it is. But you go, actually, no, it's, it was the wrong. It, I'm building it up. It's like the gag, isn't it? It's like, a, it's, it's like the joke. You know, the punchline is falling flat. Why is the punchline falling flat? Because you haven't got the steps up to it. So you might know that this has to be there, but you've got to get the steps right. And then we talked about, so it was, it was ending actually. And that was the big discussion. Okay, if you're gonna keep it, we need to end on something different. And that's when we ended on Evelyn and Ulysses going to the, um, the graveyard because the big, there was a big discussion that, he, that Ulysses had to have somebody at the end. Yeah. And we needed to round up and we need to give him something. And, and I said, well, we're, we're, we've got those two, we've got Darnley and we've got Evelyn. And Evelyn is a mother. Evelyn is so important to him, you know, um, especially for a young man, because, you know, this young man lost his parents very young, lost them before he went to war. And I think this is what we're forgetting. We're also forgetting the parental relationship with Cress and with Evelyn. So, you know, he's got his work cut out as well. But these things are, you know, I find it, I find working with editors fascinating. You know, I don't have a solipsistic view necessarily. I love collaboration, but I also like working it out when it when it's not working. It so somebody here is saying it's not working, and you're going, I know it's going to work. I know it's working. So why isn't it? Why are people saying? So let's really like be forensic. That's it's not about being precious, but sometimes in your guts you just know, but you just got to work out. Maybe it's you know I haven't presented it in the right way. Lisa, you can do one more question because, I, like I said, I have 17 more. I wanted to ask about being edited in the United States and Great Britain because we love Sally Kim. and Yeah, yeah, Sally's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, anything she tells me to read, I, I will read. I We loved the coincidence and the missed coincidences in the story. Oh, um, yes. The, oh, the, my the, gosh. The, yes, where you, they just weren't right in the same place at the right time. We love that. And it talks and, about how you, the ending wasn't, or the lead up wasn't quite in the right place at the right time. It was yeah. all through the book in that way. Yeah. yeah. I don't really have more questions. I can just sit and gush for more. Oh. My, you know, if you have a very specific, we hit, I mean, I want to know about the globe making because I love that aspect of it. And we don't really talk, we haven't really talked about that. And, and in other interviews, I haven't seen it, but why globe making? And I mean, that's a real quick, like. Question. Yeah, because, because I, because I love it. Um, yeah. So it was practical things. So I have done some writing in the past for a blog called Spittlefield's Life. And it's written by the gentle author and it's a beautiful blog. And one of his posts was on a man called Peter Bellaby. And um, Peter, ages ago, wanted to give his dad a handmade globe for his 80th birthday. And he couldn't find one, they were mass produced. So he thought, I'm gonna make one. And he went through the old process of making a globe. So he managed to get half spheres. They were, I think they were plastic, but he got half spheres and he learned how to do it, with plaster of Paris. And then he learned how to put the gauze on. Um, a little bit different because he had a computer and you could print out the world you can print the gauze out anyway you could get them so but but he did it I think he said his dad got it like on his 85th birthday it took a long time but he did it and everyone who saw this globe said it's absolutely amazing it's amazing can I have one anyway he's got a factory in Stoke Newington now multi-million pound turnover of handmade globes and I spent the afternoon with him and it's beautiful and it's something about painting a globe again it's the image of of the William Anders and the earth. There's something so precious about, you know, this earth, this home. So of course he would nurture it. 
Yeah. Also, um, remember, I mean, there, there's lots of practicalities here. Ulysses can't speak Italian and he needs a he needs a purpose and he needs a job. And so it had to be something that he could do by himself. Also, the idea of globes opposite, you know, the the uh, the museum, what is now the Galileo Museum, where all the old globes. It, it, it was a, it was a job that tied up with Florence itself visually. And it felt as a certainly in that area, which was an artisanal area, that it would be something that he could definitely do. So so that's why. It's also um, it also ties into something Sally had phrased it as a question, but I think it's a nice coda where she wrote in from your book, the scale of man spatially is about midway between the atom and the star. And oh, yeah. it feels like a globe is a perfect. It's a beautiful quote. I wish I could claim it. It's not mine. It's um, it's by a man. It was by a man called A.S. Eddington in a book he wrote called Stars and Atoms. And I use it. Cressy uses it in this book. And it's just fabulous. I mean, it, 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 Eddington then goes on and, you know, adds to it. But basically, the, the real midway point is a hippopotamus, apparently. Um, <laughs> Again, I can't claim it. I would love to claim it, but I can't. Um, but the, you know, these ideas, these ideas are very, these ideas, and they were probably were in the fifties, maybe earlier than that. We've sort of made such great headway scientifically that sometimes when you go back to these old books, there's a there's a poetry and an innocence, knowing what we now know. Do you have one more question, Daniel? No, I'm passing it to you. You can close oh, things out. I will close things out. What have you been reading that you've loved lately? Oh my goodness. Oh, I loved um, Isabel Colgate. I loved um, Orlando King. I really liked that. That was three books in one. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I actually haven't been reading a great deal because I'm researching and I'm sort of shutting all that down while I'm you is know, it a busy. little book or a big book it's about that big oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good size yeah. book I loved it and I loved I also loved O Caledonia by Elspeth Barker which I thought was terrific both of them both are just there was a robust two women writers um this kind of muscularity of writing that is quite rare quite rare um, again, you know, it's the, they, their own structure, again, which I think is quite rare. So I, I you know, I've loved reading that. Um, and, and then I've been reading um, a lot of Jan Morris. So, you know, travel writing. Um, but, you know, I, I, find, I find reading a bit, bit tricky at the moment, you know, especially when I'm just trying to think about what I'm doing and where I'm going. So it's it's never, it's never I can never come up with a good answer when people ask me that question. <laughs> you know, I can't wow you. It's like sort of a bit dull. Wow really. us. No, I think those are good answers. <laughs> You're fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't give you the forewarning because we were talking about other stuff beforehand. Usually we yeah. give you a heads Usually up. we say, do you have anything? <laughs> Talk something up. It could be a friend, whatever. <laughs> Um, oh, I do. I do. I loved Rachel Joyce. She, she um, did the last book of her trilogy on, you know, on the pilgrimage of Harold Fry. So it was Maureen's story. And yeah. I loved that. I loved the fact that she brought these three books together. Um, cool. Very small book, but a very tender book, you know, very delicate book. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. There you go. Cool. So, yeah. Who knew? Well, thank you. <laughs> um, we will have this uh, recording. Uh, out in a few days. I like it's, it's right before Christmas. Might take might take my uh, partners a little longer. Um, but we wanted to thank you for joining us. Um, thank everybody for attending. We wouldn't have two bookstores or a, a virtual series without you. Um, and uh, hope, looking forward to your next book. And as I said, I am going to read one of your first two books. I have to. If do you have a preference of which one I should try to chase down? No, I mean they're very different. Okay. You know, they, they are very, very different. So okay. <clears throat> Rabbit was the first. And I think, you know, it was that usual thing that I've had with every book. Next book that people go, oh, it's so different. 
Yeah. Um, and it and it and it is marvelous. Was quite a slow burn when it came out, and now it's probably the book I get most letters about from mm. people. Well, maybe one day it'll be in the night. We'll be able to get it easily. In maybe, the night. maybe. But yeah, thank you guys. Thank you. I've had such a good time with you. I think this is probably close to my you know last last interview or chat with people you know before another oh, one so I know, saying goodbye good. and hello been, to the next book probably yeah but it's yeah. been lovely and anyone who's been sort of listening thank you so much and yeah i've, I've got so much out of this it made me very happy this evening really yeah. thank you All right. thank you thank you Bye. So much. thanks